Recently, we've all been watching the uh, adventures of Rosetta and uh, uh, the little lander uh, Philae as it's as uh, they've been visiting this comet um, 67P, and uh, as uh, Philae went down and then landed on the comet, and then we found out the next day bounced off and flew for almost two hours uh, before it bounced again and flew for another few minutes and finally came to rest in some kind of a dark spot. So the big question on everyone's mind uh, since that time has been where is that lander? Where did it land? Well yesterday the uh, European Space Association uh, uh, released some photos of Philae just immediately after that first impact when it bounced off the surface and it bounced off in a very different direction I think than anyone expected and uh, with maybe a little bit more force than they were expecting and um, so uh, putting that together with what we know about the comet I've been experimenting the past uh, day or two with the uh, orbiter uh, spaceflight simulator which allows you to put in things like the actual shape of the comet, the actual gravitational field of the comet, the actual parameters for the spacecraft like Rosetta and, and uh, Philae and uh, see how it all works together and I don't think it totally tells us where the lander landed but it surely gives us some pretty strong parameters about where it could go and where it couldn't go. So the first thing we know about the lander, and you're just watching the same kind of animation from different viewpoints now, this is from the lander's viewpoint, but it landed uh, uh, right on the top of the comet on the kind of the small half, and it landed right next to this big crater. Um, so the first thing they thought is the lander might have bounced off and gone into the crater and got lodged against the wall. Well, we know now that that can't be true. One reason is because they released the photo showing which direction it went, and it was clearly going to the side of the crater, which is what you just saw. And then the other thing is you can very well figure out the at least the horizontal velocity that that lander had after the bounce and it was going way too fast to stop at that uh, crater and then the other thing we know is how long the uh, lander flew it uh, flew about an hour and 50 minutes after that first bounce so 660 seconds so um, that puts some pretty strong uh, restrictions on where that lander could go. So there it is, it's up by the crater. This is sped up by about a thousand times and you can see it just goes around that uh, kind of big cliff past the neck that uh, joins the two halves of the comet together and then lands on the opposite uh, that giant hillside near the top of it. Now the reason I'm pretty sure that is where the lander must have landed somewhere in that area is because of this. If the lander, you can see the uh, uh, crater that the lander is going past right now, if it had flown over into that crater and just landed on the other side, that would have been about a 20 or 30 minute flight. It would be over by this point and we know it was not over. It went on for, a, for another hour and a half almost after that. And we also know that it went past this sort of giant cliff that it's approaching now. And the reason is because we have photos as it's approaching that cliff with plenty of horizontal velocity and, and they figure it has some vertical velocity too. Probably about a third of a meter per second vertical velocity and maybe about 0.3 or 0.4 meters per second uh, in horizontal. So that's just enough to get it past that cliff. Well, another theory people have had is it went over the cliff and landed right in the crook, uh, right in between the two halves of the comet. Well, you can see how the momentum works out. Uh, if it has enough momentum to get, back, get past that cliff, there's no way it's going to be able to go right down into the bottom, the depth of that crook. Um, <clears throat> so one of the strongest pieces of evidence that uh, it landed somewhere on that hillside and probably somewhere near the top of the hillside is that... Um, in orbiter you can time how long these flights take starting at pretty much the exact spot the orbiter started at it's going the exact direction we know it was going uh, these flights are taking just almost exactly 660 seconds so 
it couldn't be much shorter or much longer than that. And the thing is, like I say, if, if, it, if it hadn't got off the top plateau, the flight would be over now much shorter than 660 seconds. If, by chance, it had gone just a little bit longer and gone over the top of that big hill, the flight would have gone, you can see, just the way the orbital dynamics are working. If it were going just a little bit faster and slipped past the top of that hill, it would probably be flying at least another hour before it turned around and came down and uh, hit maybe on the other side of that uh, hill on the bottom right from our perspective here is the next chance it would have had to contact the common. So that uh, would have taken at least three hours. I'd say I've been messing around with these simulations for a while. So you start to get a sense of what's possible and what's not possible. If it went past that hill, it would be flying for at least another hour. It would maybe be pretty much in orbit around the comet. It might have been three or four hours. So this is the one spot it could come to, it can hit, it can stop, and it uh, lasts almost exactly the 660 seconds. Um, the other thing we know is uh, pretty much the horizontal velocity, um, because you can measure that from the uh, photographs that um, ESA has released and they have a pretty good guess at the vertical velocity once that lander hits the ground it was going about a meter per second at that point it bounces off the ground how much of that vertical velocity uh, will the kind of suspension of the uh, little lander absorb well they think it absorbs about two-thirds of that velocity and so it should bounce off with about a, a third of a meter per second and so if you plug those numbers in and that direction and uh, the a reasonable approximation of the gravitational field of this uh, comet. Uh, here is the uh, path you get uh, and I mess around with it quite a bit. You can get it to land a little bit short. In that case it doesn't last quite 660 seconds. You can get it to go a little bit long. In that case it lasts a little bit more than or even quite a bit more than 660 seconds. Um, so this is like the only solution that both lasts uh, for almost exactly on 660 seconds and has those uh, the right direction and the right numbers. So uh, the other thing that's kind of neat about this, you can see this uh, model of uh, the comet is the one that uh, ESA released based on the Rosetta data just three or four weeks ago. And you probably have seen some people have printed it out with 3D printers and so on, but it's really neat to be able to import this actual data from this uh, comet that we, we've now landed on into Orbiter and be able to look at it from all sides and see how th an object like the lander might interact with it um, before uh, we had this data of they'd had a 3D object that people had used for this comet and it basically looked like a potato you know so <laughs> kind of generic so it's really neat to be able to put in this actual comet looking object that actually matches up feature for feature it has a little neck in the middle has the crater on top it has the giant uh, sort of hillside with all the deep ravines where the lander hit and uh, really kind of gives you the impression of being there a lot more so than uh, if you're just playing with a potato. We've been doing that quite a bit in Orbiter. Now one thing I wanted to do is just give you some kind of a perspective of what the lander would have seen. So here it is immediately after impact. Um, this is going at about 10 times uh, real time. So a little bit faster, quite a bit faster, and then eventually we'll speed it up to 100 times um, because otherwise we'd be sitting for almost two hours waiting for it to land on the other side. But it gives you some idea that you can see the crater off to your left is going just to the right of it. Now it's going over the big cliff. We saw the photo had plenty of velocity to get over the edge of it. So then it falls over this big cliff. And one of the photos we saw from ESA uh, we saw that the lander uh, at this point was tipped about the way this is here. So it wasn't perfectly flat according to the top, but it, the um, sort of bottom leg had uh, slewed forward. And it's just possible because it has a kind of a, a gyroscopic thing to help keep it uh, 
stabilized. If it turned that direction going over the cliff, then it stayed in that direction. And as you can see, that's a good configuration to land on this uh, hillside that's looming up in front of us now. So if that happened, that may be one reason that the lander survived so well. Obviously, if it had gotten turned upside down at this point and landed right on its top, that, that might not have been the best uh, thing that could have happened to it. And this is an example, because we did see it does have stabilization, but in some of the photos you saw it turning a little bit, turning back a little bit. It, it's very possible that it could have gotten destabilized, maybe not quite as much as, as we saw there, but it could have been uh, spinning a little bit. And um, it's hard to tell which way is up on these comets, and there's probably a little bit of luck involved that it landed the right way. So where did the little lander land? Uh, I think there's only one answer, and it, it's this hill. It's not the bottom of the hill. It's not over the top of the hill. None of those match up with the 660 seconds. It's got to be near the top of the hill and in that straight line from the photos we saw.